This is a static equilibrium problem. Pause the video and read through the question carefully. In this question, we're asked to consider a climber who is trying to cross a stream. And they've done so by taking this log, which is 340 kilograms in mass, and they've lent it against a vertical frictionless ice cliff. So that's kind of important too. The log has uh, is sloped up at 27 degrees, and its center of gravity is one third along the length of the log, and we're given the length at 6.3 meters. We're told the coefficient of friction between the left hand end um, and the ground is 0.92, so that coefficient of friction acts down here. And the question we're asked is, what's the maximum mass that we want to find of the climber and their pack? Uh, so that the log doesn't slip, that is, so the log doesn't rotate. Uh, so the log has to remain stationary, it mustn't accelerate, therefore this is really a problem on static equilibrium. It means the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero, and the sum of the torques about some pivot point, wherever you choose it, must be zero as well. So the task for developing this problem is to draw a free body diagram um, with all of the forces acting where they should be acting because uh, that's really important so we can represent this by uh, here's my log uh, I'm going to do this symbolically so let's say that the angle between uh, the log and the ground I'm going to call that uh, theta 1 and uh, this is the frictionless surface over here mu is equal to 0 the log has a length L. Importantly, the center of gravity of this log is actually one third um, along the log. So one third L between here and, and the center of gravity. The center of gravity is where the, the weight of the log acts. So in fact, we could draw our first force down here, which we'll call M1G. That's the weight of the log. So M1 is 340 kilograms. We also have to concern ourselves with the uh, climber who's going to reach the very top up here so they'll have a mass m2 the climber and their pack uh, so that means that there'll be a weight force acting down on the log here which is m2g they can't be the only two forces acting on the log because if it was it would be accelerating uh, vertically you're falling down uh, let's take y as being up and x as being across so y is vertical x is horizontal so there has to be another um, force in the upwards direction and so that force we can label here, this is where it acts, N1 acts where the log touches the ground. We can see from the sum of the forces in the y direction that uh, for them to remain zero, that N1 must be equal to M1 plus M2 multiplied by G. And there are no other forces acting in the vertical direction, so that uh, must be true. Now that those three forces aren't the only forces which are acting and we can tell that by if I was to put a pivot point at the end here and think about the torques about that pivot point so the torques are the forces that try and uh, uh, turn the object then if you look at the two weight forces they both try and rotate the object in a clockwise direction and there's no torque which tries to balance that at the moment and so this object would just rotate. So there must be another force somewhere we haven't included. So, and that force comes from the fact that the log is resting um, against this uh, wall, this ice cliff. So we'll say there's a normal force acting um, to the left. And that normal force is going to provide a torque, or at least the component of that normal force, uh, which is perpendicular to L, provides a torque which acts in the counterclockwise direction. So the sum of those two torques will be zero. Because we've introduced that horizontal force, it means there must be a further force we need to have a look for as well. Um, and that's going to come from the fact that the ground here um, has some uh, friction, and therefore there must be a, a force which acts uh, across to the right here. Um, that's my force of friction. Its magnitude is going to be given by the coefficient of friction times N1. And we can see from the sum of the forces in the x direction for them to be zero, that means that um, N2 must be equal to 
mu n1. So the magnitudes of those two forces are the same. And rather than writing mu n1, what we can write that in is mu m1 plus m2 times g. So that's just using this equation here. The third equation is going to allow us to evaluate m2. So we need to look at what the sum of the torques are about our pivot point, and they should be equal to zero. I've chosen this point down here as my pivot point because the torques provided by n1 and the friction force are zero, so they drop out of the problem. Just reminding you that the torque um, is given by the uh, magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the distance times the sine of the angle between the two forces, um, or if you'd like, you can remember that the torque is given by um, the force times the perpendicular distance, or you can think of it as the perpendicular component of the force times the distance from the pivot point to where the force acts. We will use each, uh, uh, you know, the, we'll use these two when we're, when we're evaluating that. I'm also going to draw those in a slightly different colour as well. So let's first of all think about the torque which uh, is provided by the weight force of the log. Okay. Um, it's easiest to just drop to see this force is acting down this way. Uh, well, this length here is the perpendicular length. So if we can write down the torque as given by the magnitude of the force, which is m1 times g, uh, times by this perpendicular distance. So the hypotenuse to this little triangle here is one third times l1. Sorry, times l. Uh, multiplied by uh, we can see that that's the cosine. Of theta one. Okay, the um, that's the torque, and we'll say that torques acting in a clockwise direction are positive. That's just my choice. Uh, the uh, weight force from the climber m two g that also um, you can see is going to be um, providing a torque which tries to rotate clockwise, so we'll make that positive. The magnitude of the force is m2g, the perpendicular distance which I've got here um, is uh, given by now the hypotenuse for that triangle is L uh, times the cosine of theta 1 um, and then finally we need to think about the uh, torque which is provided by the normal force of the ice wall and so the way I'm going to draw that actually is we really want this component of the normal force uh, so it's so I'm using this expression here, the perpendicular component of the force times this distance. So it's negative because we're going to take counterclockwise as being negative because clockwise is positive. Um, that distance is going to be L, uh, that component of the force. How do I get that? If I look here, just some trigonometry, theta 1 here is the same as this angle here. Theta 1, uh, this component of the force is the same as this component up here. Uh, so it's just going to be given by N2 times... Um, that's going to be the opposite side, so sine of theta 1. And the sum of those torques must be 0. We can simplify this a little bit further um, by recognising that um, L appears in each term, so it drops out. And if we rewrite N2 um, as uh, mu times M1 plus M2 times G, then G also drops out of each term. So now let's write down this equation with m1 factored outside because it appears in two terms. I've got to be a bit careful because I've cancelled out the l's and the g's, they shouldn't appear anywhere. So m1 times one third times cosine theta 1. m1 appears over here as minus mu times m1 times sine theta 1. So sine theta 1 plus now the terms with m2, so my second term here, I've got an m2, and I've got, that's outside of cosine theta 1, so I'm factorising out m2. My final uh, term here, I've got an m2 times minus mu times sine theta 1, and that's equal to 0. Okay, I need a little bit more room to work with now. So we're trying to find the mass of the uh, climber and their pack, so that's M2. So let's rearrange this equation to get M2. So a little bit of algebra here. M2 is equal to 
um, I've got M1. I'm going to take this term and bring it across to the other side. I'm going to end up with mu sine theta 1 minus 1 third cosine theta 1 divided by, and I divide by the bracket term from M2, I get cosine of theta 1 minus mu sine of theta 1. If you're concerned why the numerator uh, swapped um, the order, because I've subtracted it to the right-hand side, and so I've just propagated the minus sign inside the bracket of the term there. Uh, and the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factorise cosine theta out from the numerator and the denominator so that they cancel, and I'm going to use the fact that sine theta 1 on cosine theta 1 is equal to tan of theta 1. So that's my next step here. So M2, it's the final step. M1 outside of, um, if I take cosine theta out, I get sine theta on cosine theta, which is tan theta here, the first term. I take cosine theta out, I just get one third for that term. Um, if I take cosine theta out of the denominator, that first term there, I just get one. And when I take cosine theta out, the sine term, I get sine on cos, which is tan, so it's mu times tan theta 1. And that's my final expression. So I've done this algebraically, so I can now put numbers in, uh, remembering that the mass of the um, uh, log was 340 kilograms, the coefficient of friction of the ground was 0 0.92, uh, the angle uh, was 27 degrees, minus one third, and then we've got one minus 0 0.92 times 10, 27 on the denominator. If I put that into my calculator, then I get that my mass, um, M2, is equal to 86.7 kilograms. So that's the maximum mass that my climber can have. Uh, I should always uh, go through and um, assess my problem. Uh, first of all, um, an order of magnitude, does my answer, my numerical answer make sense? Yes, well 87 kilograms seems pretty reasonable for a person and their backpack. Um, it certainly shouldn't be you know, any orders of magnitude bigger than that, so or smaller than that. So that seems to make sense. Um, as far as the units are concerned, then it turns out that um, you know a trig a, when you evaluate tan sine or cos of an angle you, that gives you a unitless ratio. So the all the numbers in the brackets here are unitless. So the units are just going to be given by m1. So the units are in kilograms. That makes sense. Uh, more importantly, I guess is the uh, behaviour. So let's ask ourselves a little bit about that. Um, and from here, uh, if we look at this expression. If my coefficient of friction mu increases, okay, then uh, the numerator gets larger and the denominator gets smaller, so that means that my mass can be bigger. Uh, that seems to make sense. The 